Thank you. I'm Alex Tucker. I'm the Special Projects Coordinator with the Ralph Bunch uh, Center for African American Studies. Thank you for coming out for another in our author series. Today we're very pleased to have Maureen Mann. Maureen is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology and the African American Studies program here at UCLA. She is a cultural anthropologist with research interests in African American culture, the aesthetics and political economy of popular culture, and the social construction of race. Her book, Right to Rock, The Black Rock Coalition and the Cultural Politics of Race, is her first book and a long line of what I'm sure will be many. Currently, she's at work on two projects, a study of the anthropological research conducted by Paul Robeson's wife, Eslanda Good Robinson, and a cultural history of black women in rock and roll. Without further ado, let's give her a warm hand. Coalition, 
going to the performances that the different band members and the organization put on, um, and, and talking. And I did it, and, and what makes up a lot of the book are the interviews that I did with people to talk about how they, how they came into this music, what were the sort of factors that were influencing them, both sociological, and demographic, and also aesthetic. Um, the, and then, so like, people always ask, well, who's in the book? Which, um, which artist do you talk about in the book? Who are you talking to? And I was mostly, fo I was focused on Black Rock Coalition members uh, in New York and also some in Los Angeles. And uh, the sort of, the mo probably the most well-known band that um, I had contact with was Living Color. And at the time that I was doing my research, their star was really on the rise. Um, they had re fairly recently finished touring. Um, they had done a couple of, um, major national international tours and one grand movie. So they were sort of the big lights, the leading lights of the organization. Um, I also talked about talk about Michelle and David Cello in the book. So those are sort of the big names. The other people that I was um, talking with or engaged with are much less well known. And that's another part of what I was looking at was how you sort of keep yourself going even when you're maybe the initial dream was to, you know, get famous and get the Grammys. But the reality is much more um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to put this. Oh, I guess the, the last thing I'll say about sort of the interest, the things that were um, were driving my interest in, at the sort of more theoretical or scholarly level were questions around uh, black American identity in the post-civil rights era and how after the civil rights movement had you know, sort of won certain uh, political rights, what were the, what's the sort of cultural fallout? And so in the 1980s and 1990s, you have people who came of age in a very different, in a very particular historical moment. And so part another thing that I was looking at was how their um, identities, their music, their politics were shaped by the fact that they uh, came of age uh, after the civil rights movement, during the period of integration. And these were people who were going, some of the first to integrate um, public education. Um, so sort of, and, and also their class identity as middle class black people, how did all of those things affect and influence what they were doing as artists and activists? So I think, I think I'll stop there and open up to let, if you all have questions about either the research, people in the, in the, uh, in the bands or in the book, I would be more than In your research, were you able to find out like, what are the reasons why African Americans disassociate themselves in such big numbers from rock music and being the ones that started? Mm -hmm. There's probably not a single reason, uh, one single reason. And I think one of the things that's interesting is it's it's very generational. Um, so if, you know, if you were a teenager in the 1950s, you may have a very different perspective on rock and roll or who's supposed to be connected to rock and roll than someone who came of age in the 1970s and the 1980s. But um, I think one of the things that happened was rock and roll was first played in black communities by black people for black people in the 1950s, and then it started to cross over. Um, and it started to be played on radio stations that um, reached white audiences, particularly white teenagers, and then they started to embrace the music. And the, what a lot of people, so people have different theories, what a lot of people said to me was, well, black people are always moving forward with music, and they, they wanted to, they went to new things, and to stay with rock and roll would have been staying with an old thing. Um, another, and so in the 60s, soul, soul music developed, and then in the late 70s, you start to get the development of rap. So there was one argument that, well, Black people were moving through different music forms. They did rock and roll, and they lost the interest in the guitar and, and went to other forms. Uh, another argument that people made, and this is both people who I talked to in the Black Rock Coalition, and just other critics who write about music and shows some music. Um, another argument that was made was once the music started to get um, embraced by white people, uh, it got seen, it began to be associated with them as a white form. Uh, more and more white musicians started to play it. And it no longer seemed to, it no longer had the appearance of being a black form. In other words, black people started to get um, pushed away from the form, even uh, discursively, so that the form uh, rock and roll, the name rock and roll, is a term that started to get used once white people started to get involved in the music. 
And so the people who had been playing this form of music all along, they were referred to as rhythm and blues. And the people who were uh, coming in, so you had people like Ruth Brown or Etta James um, playing something that was called rhythm and blues. And then when white performers started playing it, like Jerry Lewis or Elvis Presley, it started to be called rock and roll. So there was a, a, a linguistic way of, of this, you know, distinguishing between the two forms. Um, and that just that association with white people and this music continued. And it made it harder as a black person to connect to the music because of certain ideas about what what artistic forms or creative forms black people should be involved in. Um, with the Black Rock Coalition members, they were coming of age in the period of the late 1960s and early 1970s where there were a lot of um, there were a lot of black rock or funk bands, so people who were playing live instruments, uh, Jimi Hendrix, who of course is the first person who comes to mind, but then bands like Funkadelic, the Hyatt Players, and these were all bands that they were really inspired by and they wanted to kind of do something like that. But by the mid-1980s, there was an assumption that black music was dance music, um, rhythm and blues, focused on both the vocal artists, not the instrumentalists. And so they did, it was sort of like they, their timing was off in a way. Um, they, music moved, black music moved in a certain direction, and they were going in another direction. Yeah. In lecture, you uh, mentioned that the African American community, black community, is responsibly solely for all creativity and original forms of music, genres that ever pierced, I guess, society. I guess in the process of writing your book, did you ever come across, I don't know, say a protagonist or Elvis Presley fanatic or someone who argues against that? Um, so, well, Ariane is in my, um, what is our class called? MCC4. <laughs> I just go in and teach <clears throat> um, the Afro American experience in the United States. And so, um, what I was saying is that, and this, this is an argument. Um, that a lot of people have made, and we were talking about in the context of the voice making the argument that the only, he says the only original music, the only music that's the new form created in the United States has been created by black Americans. Now that's a debatable statement to make. So there are other people who would say, well, no, other people have created really original music. But the, 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 the music that black Americans have created in the United States is, I think you could say, has been the most influential in terms of other creating getting people inspired and other people picking it up so you have it going around the world and coming back in really interesting ways. Um, so you're asking whether there was anyone I talked to who wanted to argue in my, <coughs> the people who I was uh, doing my research with? Yes. No, they were really very, they were very ardently, <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, um, very ardently uh, committed to the idea that um, the black creativity that um, produced rock and roll needed to be recognized, and one of the issues that they had was that, that wasn't, it was no longer recognized. So that um, really influential people like Little Richard or Chuck Berry, um, Jimi Hendrix is an exception, he's always recognized, um, but um, influential guitarists, influential vocalists who are coming out of black music traditions and have influenced rock and roll, pop music, but then, you know, other forms also, um, to, don't get all of their, all the recognition that they really do. Uh, and that was something that they felt very strongly about. And one of the ways they addressed that was by doing um, performances to sort of draw attention to those creative people. So you mentioned Elvis Presley. One of the early performances that the Black Rock Coalition did was a concert um, with Otis Blackwell and in his honor, now, Otis Blackwell was the man who wrote um, some of the hit songs <coughs> that Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis sang, but no one ever, you know, no one ever thinks about the songwriter anyway. But when they were, when people were writing songs back then, they would also record, often record demos just so the performers could kind of know how to do the song. And so he was, he's influencing uh, white rock and rollers, but his name has sort of gone by the wayside. And um, unfortunately, the way money worked back then, often songwriters and black originators didn't get paid. So there was also there's also an economic concern. They just got to hang out. They just got to hang out. Um, in your research, the musicians, band members who um, appear in your book, did you did they give you a sense of 
how they may view themselves in terms of the genre of rock and roll. So I, I think that for a lot of black musicians, there's always the sort of assumption that they should represent something of the community, something of you know black, or that there should be some sort of political message and social messages, things like that. Did um, for the people who appear in your book, did you see that they sort of view their music like that or no? Um, I think there's there's maybe there's always that kind of pressure that black people are supposed to talk to those kinds of political issues, and I think I think it's an uncomfortable thing for artists because they don't that's not always what's in their heart that they want to speak about. But some people talked about feeling frustrated with, um, in the mid-1980s, the sort of ways that black pop, the, the sort of mainstream black popular music was just about sort of love songs and dance songs. And it was very light dance music. And it was very light topically. Um, <clears throat> and they were very influenced by people like Chris Mayfield, Stevie Wonder, who always had social content, or even Funkadelic who would have some social or political commentary in their songs even though they were very funky. So they wanted to con they wanted to be able to do that. But I think there was a, a lot of talk about just wanting to be free to do whatever and not to be limited, be, you know, because you're black, we expect you to play in this kind of genre or we expect you to have this kind of content in your song. And there was a sort of pushing against those restrictions. A lot of yeah. um, so, uh, like when I think about that, I, uh, in terms of like uh, cultural influence, right? If you have um, uh, a source that's starting to cross over and influence people on a social spectrum, and if you are like, because I view the industry in a large part of controlling this, it's just like uh, when you begin to speak in like you know, let's say like white people or white teenagers begin to um, start listening to the to the lyrics and how they're talking, then it becomes uh, a red alert, right? Because you have this cultural influence that you really can't control. So what you do is like, okay, so because there's an influence now, now you start having white rock and roll bands, right? So then you can come in and control the lyrics of, of how they go, right? Or um, how uh, uh, social issues are presented. And at that same time, you can distance the other way. You cut away. It's the same thing that's happening in rap right now. It's like when you start, you start taking the social aspect of it and you start watering it down so it can be assimilated into main culture while at the same time disenfranchising you from your own music. Because it's like um, the way the industry uh, makes it seem is that we're all like stuck in these shells and don't cross boundaries. You know. So if we if, if, if you know that you have, uh, are influenced by these different things, but yet you have to go against these generic cookie cutter uh, boxes on both sides, if you're white or black, then it's a way of, of you, even though you have these other things to, uh, in order to, um, uh, to socially uh, get along with people, you say, you know, because most people are afraid to step, step out of their box and then want the most even, the most equal level, then they say, oh, this is what I, you know, I'm into, or this is what I'm into, because it's accepted, but at the same time, their deeper ideals can't be expressed, and then, like, if they were, like, saying, um, I don't know, I'm starting to go out there now, but, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really, um, but thank you, no, but thank you for your comment, because I think what you're talking about is this weird, this weird position that we get into because of the, I mean, the, you know, the book is about black rock and roll, but the, the bigger thing the book is about is race in the United States. And the, the, what, your question, what your comment is pointing to is the way we get into these really weird positions because there are certain race, racial rules or, rule, or rules about racial identity that are so strict at the level of how we're, you know, we kind of get taught. But at the same time, the reality is you know, things are much more complicated. There's much, like you're saying, there's much more crossing back and forth. Um, the way um, marketing categories are imagined by the music industry that this demographic of people will always listen to this music. It's much more narrow and simplistic than how I, probably everyone in this room listens to music. You probably cross back and forth in your record collection. Does it make racial marketing sense? Um, but we do, especially as you know, especially for the um, the artists who are trying to work in these industries. You, you get in a really in a really tight position, and a lot of the time. 
um, the people in the Black Rock Coalition would use language like being between a rock and a hard place or falling through the cracks. They're just like, they're, they don't fit anywhere. They're not in the right place anywhere. Um, but the, you know, the other thing is if you're a creative, if any kind of artist, you create something and you put it out into the world, you can't control it anymore. It's, it's out of your hands. And you have no idea how the different audiences who encounter it are going to read it and interpret it or misinterpret it in your, you know, in your view. It's just, you, you can't control it. But it's even edited before it goes out to the public, to okay. the industry. Okay. That's what I'm talking about, okay. that part, because if um, artists were allowed to truly um, create how they feel, it wouldn't be the stuff that's coming out. But because mm -hmm. the industry needs hits, and stuff like that, then you get like, you know, uh, new kids on the block, that kind of stuff, bubblegum stuff. And then you have that also in, you know, in every category. So it's like if you're going to step outside of that bounds, you're almost forced to uh, think about things economically because that's basically what it comes down to. You, if you're going to survive and eat, you're like, oh, I'm going to go against what I truly believe and put this little pop hit out. So that's where I think that. Um, um, a lot of the issue uh, rises from that, please. Yeah, yeah. And some people, it's it's interesting, This, I mean, this happened really after I finished writing the book because te technology changed. But one of the things that's happening right now is people, um, because of the way uh, the accessibility of computer technology, editing capacity, you can do a lot of stuff at home, and you can do stuff a lot more cheaply. So there's a lot more self-production. And so people are not working within the confines of the mainstream music or even small independent labels, and they're producing their own stuff and selling it on their own, and, you know, their shows or through the internet. And so they're not going to get the reach that your demonized new kids on the block are going to get, but they're going to be able to, they can do what they want to do. They don't have to try to listen to, you know, they don't have to play by the rules. The rules do kind of make sense if you want to sell a lot of stuff. But yeah, th and those are choices, you know, different, different groups, different artists make different choices around it. Yeah. Uh, I think I was 14 when I saw this movie. It's actually my favorite movie, The Five Heartbeats. And there's a scene when the album cover comes out and it's little white children playing on a beach. And The Five Heartbeats, uh, which is a portrayal of the actual group, The Dells, um, R&B soul um, group. And... In this movie, they say, crossover is nothing but a double cross. Mm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this scene, but um, what this gentleman in front is talking about, I can sort of identify with. Working at record companies for the last five years, you're right. When it, at the end of the day, it's about a business. It's about economics. It's about hits. But on the same note, people must be, I guess, they, they must understand the historic backdrop of where it all comes from. But on on the inside, they're not worried about all that. Like exactly. I get to see both ends of it, and I have, and I am currently seeing both both sides of it, and that's just how it works, you know. And then you have artists currently who are, I mean, stuck in between. I mean, sort of like liminality, living betwixt in between. They don't know if they want to stay true to themselves, culturally conscious of what they're saying, because it will be influential. It's going to be in the mainstream media. If they have that star power, they're going to reach out to the communities. But at the same time, they need to make money. They have to eat. What do they do? What do they do? Yeah. And those are, you know, those are dilemmas for, for a lot of artists. Um, and, they, you know, and everyone makes different choices. Or the same person makes different choices at different moments. Different career, depending on how, like, what seems to make the most sense. I have a question. Um, Perhaps two questions. The first really has to do to do with the idea of rock, rap, or rap rock. I'm not sure exactly what they call it. Yeah. And sort of that, the, the ways in which um, the people who you're talking about, they would feel about that sort of combination, or the ways in which that sort of really grew out of sort of white rockers adopting sort of, sort of rap style mm -hmm. um, in thinking about challenging this category of being a, a rock artist. And so the question is really about the investment of, of uh, your subjects in their identity as a rocker. Mm -hmm. um, and my second question has to do with people like Janet Jackson, 
um, Who Had a Hit with Black Cat, which was really a rock song. A lot of Michael Jackson stuff was rock, but never got marked as, as, as that, but were still immensely popular within the African American community. So I wonder if you could comment a little bit about, about why you think um, some some sort of mainstream black artists, R&B or pop artists, were able to, to have rock hits mm -hmm. in the 90s, but we really don't see too many black rock groups able to, uh, to, to, to sort of have hits, particularly in the African American community. Um, I'll ask, I'll, start, with I'll start with your last question. I might have to get you to remind me of your first okay. question. Uh, I think with artists like the ones you named, Janet Jackson or Michael Jackson, and I always like to use the example of Prince. Um, they started out much more clearly identified with R&B. And the, the sort of thing that black artists had to do, in, and this is in the, everything's changed now, but in the 80s uh, and the 90s, you had to prove yourself as an R&B, as a black artist, as an R&B artist. And then if you did really well, they would start talking about crossing over, and crossing you over. And so, um, Prince's, I don't know if you know Prince's first album, it's called For You, and it's, it's a great album, but it's totally a, like an R&B album. Um, and it's sort of like he held back. Uh, and then he was successful, that album did really well, Olivia Lover was you know, big, a really great, uh, really great selling song. And then after that he, was started, he started to, he got crazy, and he did Controversy, and uh, Dirty Mind, and all of these things that were really out there. And in his live performance, he was always much more of a rocker than he was able to be on his recordings. He always played a lot more guitar. He it went out and sold, you know, the solos and all of this. Um, but he had to be restrained in a certain way in the, in his, on his album. So I think what happened is that they did the um, they did the, the the proving, and then they allowed them. They got crossed over, and I think that's what happened with, happened with a lot of black artists who um, genre was a little bit more mixed, so that they could be. Rock and roll. Uh, you know, the other thing is just to ask questions about what these genre term, terms mean, you know, or whether they really have any meaning. Because um, you know, I, you know, I think most normal people don't sit around and try to say, this is something Michael Jackson's song is a rock song, this one is, you know, an R&B. <laughs> you know, they, it's just music and it sounds really good. But you need to have these categories in order to market it. And basically, marketing categories are, if they're black, they're R&B, and if they're white, they're rock and roll. The Red Hot Chili Peppers may be really funky, and you might even want to say they belong in the, you know, in the R&B section, but they're always going to be in rock because they're white. And Prince, who really rock, I think rocks really hard on a lot of his albums, he's always going to be in R&B. So it's a racial category. It's not, a, it's not a real description of the sound of the music. Now, the first question you asked was about rock, was about, was rock, about, rock, 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 yeah, rock. Yeah, and, and sort of um, how... The, the people you're interviewing will respond to that. Um, I, I have no idea. I mean, that the, one of the great things about talking with real people is they're, you can never know what they're going to say. And uh, they're very, they'll be very unpredictable. And probably if I asked 10 people, there would be 10 different opinions. But the rock rap thing happened before. It happened in the early 90s. And so and Living Color was one of the bands that recorded one of those rock rap mashup kind of stuff. Now it's mashups. Now it's done differently. Technologically as opposed to live recording, but anyway, um, so different people are going to say different things. Some people might think it's really cool. Other people might think it's you know just another gimmick to try to sell something. Uh, some people I've, I've heard some people say uh, rap is, and you all may, may be saying this yourself, rap is sort of flagging. Its energy is flagging. It doesn't. It's it's become um, so mainstream it's kind of lost its way, all of that kind of language. So this is a way to, to inject some new energy into it, to do something different with something that's getting a little stale. Um, to sort of uh, bounce off of that, with the Jay-Z sort of coming out with the rock album, and then also with um, the popularity of writing and stuff being um, put into um, rock and roll, all the thing, do you see the potential for this uh, of like black rock, or, um, coming in the well, I'm always hopeful. <laughs> um, you know, I'll say yes to be optimistic and positive. Uh, but there's, you know, there's just no telling. 
And there have there, there's been moments, there was a, another moment like five or six years ago when um, most devs started recording, started performing with, performing with um, a couple of members of Living Color and Bernie Worrell from, uh, from the Funkadelic. And there was sort of this, oh, rap is, you know, this very prominent rapper is going to start to go towards rock. And there, were, there was a little spate of black rockers. Uh, at that moment. Um, so I'm always hopeful. Uh, and, and I think, you know, this other thing, this idea that maybe people are getting tired of rap and looking for something new. And there have a lot of rap groups who have been a little bit more um, experimental. Their form, the experiment takes a form of playing live instruments and being more like a band. Mm -hmm. being more like a band. So yeah, it could, ha it could happen. And I'll say yes to secure the positive. in keeping with what uh, what a lot of the people in the Black Rock Coalition were doing, because this goes back to a comment or question someone made, and I didn't really address it, but it had to do with the investment in whether they were rockers or not. And I think rock was partly a political term, um, and it, whether it describes the music of a lot of the people in the organization is up for grabs. It, it, a lot of people would be much closer to something like funk um, or even certain kind of progressive jazz. So the, um, the term rock might not be the best descriptor for, descriptive term for all of the music that's being produced by the organization, but politically to say we want to have access to this very broad category that black people are restricted from is really important. So I think, and, and I say that because a lot of the music that they were developing was taking from previous uh, genres of music, a lot of them black association genres, so R&B or reggae, um, you know, soul music, and even rap, because there was a lot more connection, there was a lot more use of rock in early rap than you might really remember. And so it sounds like the people that you're talking about are really continuing that kind of practice of taking from a bunch of different things and smushing it all together and coming up with something um, kind of familiar. And you always have to have something kind of familiar with pop music, because that's what people, like the audience, can latch on to. But it sounds a little bit different. It has like a slight difference. Well, I was wondering, um, if any of the, the interview talked about or experienced the same kind of um, U.S. versus U.K., you know, American versus European mm -hmm. perception of themselves mm -hmm. as rock um, artists, mm -hmm. whether they came across the same kind of conflicts or had similar experiences to our early jazz musicians? That, that's a really good question. And actually, uh, not so much specifically in the UK, but um, Europe and Japan are really important to a lot of the people that I was working with because there was um, a lot more space for the kind of music that they were producing there than they found in the United States. Um, and so they could they could do their thing on a very kind of small level in the US and then they could tour in Europe and do fairly high profile tours where they could appear at, um, during the summer, there are a lot of, they call them jazz festivals, but the type of music played at these festivals crosses all kinds of bands. It's basically any kind of popular music festival. And those places um, were much more hospitable uh, to their music. Um, and then in Japan, they could do, at least in the late 80s and the early 90s, they could do, they did a lot of touring there, kind of residencies and, and clubs or, or bars for you know, six weeks or eight weeks. Um, and so because the racial, uh, the language about race is different in those places compared to what it is in the United States, there's more freedom. And then there are also 
there's a, um, a kind of positive stereotype of black musicians in Europe and in Japan. And so uh, there's a kind of, you know, we, we're expecting something really good for you because you're a black American musician uh, that opened things up for them. In the United States, you're a black American musician, so we expect you to be in this narrow box. So, the, so those, it was really important for them to go outside uh, to get a little, have a little bit more freedom, to get a little bit more audience, and also to make some money because those European festivals paid pretty well. I keep an answer to the show. You also mentioned that you've interviewed or talked with um, Michelle and Daniel Cello, and I was really curious um, to if you could speak a little bit about the roles of women in rock, especially black rock. Um, so I'll just look at that. Okay, that's the, that's the new stuff that I'm working on too, and um, I talk, but I do have a small section in the book about gender uh, in rock and roll, sort of how and for for black black musicians and how. The experience in rock is very different for black women and for black men, and if black men are marginalized as rock and rollers, then black women are even more marginalized because in addition to being black, they're also women, and women generally are marginalized in rock and roll. So they had a sort of double um, struggle. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, Michelle came in, sort of popped up at a time when there was some space for her. She did very well, so, uh, but she kind of was uh, exceptional in being able to get a hearing, and she really came out of the black rock over to the scene. She was playing in clubs downtown in New York, and um, was able to get signed. She got signed by Madonna's label, and Madonna's label was called Maverick, and they were just going to do that. Signed really out there experimental people. Um, I can't remember exactly when Michelle came out, but she did, you know, I think before her album was released, she came out as bisexual, so there was also her sexuality that was out there as something uh, not mainstream. And um, so she, uh, she, was, she was fairly successful. Um, generally speaking, though, there have always been black women involved in the production of rock music from the very beginning. Um, Atlantic Records is called the house that Ruth built because Ruth Brown was the first big star and she was the one who got all, had all these hit records that made it possible for Ahmed Erdogan to develop this, this dynasty. So they've always been there, uh, but I think they've often been in the background. I think the other thing with um, not all black women rockers, but a lot of them, and maybe this is also true of all women, they're not, they don't play instruments. A lot of them were singers. And over time, starting in the 1960s, there developed this idea that the, an authentic rocker wrote his own songs and played those songs himself. And so if you were singing, you didn't have the kind of authenticity that the instrumentalist had. And I think that made a lot, that made it harder for a lot of women to get taken seriously as rock. Uh, I think it's interesting if you go to Best Buy or Tower Records, perhaps, and look on the CD, um, you'll see Rap Rock, or sometimes Rock Rap, mm -hmm. and I noticed this a year ago, I just laughed to myself because I knew the marketing team who was, a, who was like, you know, guilty of this, but I had a quick question, who's on the, out, the cover of your book? The cover star is one of my favorite guitarists, his name is Renee Khan. And he was, at the, this photo is t was taken at CBGB, which is one of the sort of main places for uh, um, <coughs> sort of experimental or new uh, rock music in New York. It was where punk rock started, in, or one of the places that started punk rock in New York. Um, Renee was in a band, at the time that this photo was taken, he was in a band called Faith. And so this photo is from... Um, Time when they were doing a showcase um, for a moment, Spike Lee had a record label and he wanted to thought he was thinking about signing up so they could do a showcase for Spike Lee. So that's what and he's still play he's still out there. Uh, he plays in a band now called Burn Sugar. Take care of I can't believe you're here. Congratulations on your book. I'm so excited.
I wanted to ask you a question that kind of spins off from what you said about different musical categories being racialized. Because I wonder if um, you think, what do you think about the question of authenticity, racial authenticity for black rock and roll mm -hmm. musicians? Mm -hmm. um, I remember going to a Living Color concert in San Jose some years ago, um, and the audience was overwhelmingly white. So um, can you talk about a little bit about authenticity mm -hmm. for black rockers and how that might communicate in terms of their audiences, whether black audiences also bring that kind of expectation to them? Yeah. Um, I actually think the, that the, the question of who the audience is has a lot to do with how black and roll transitioned from a black, how, how black people started think, stopped thinking about it as a black woman because the audience started to be overwhelmingly white, and so it, was, it became easier to say, well, this isn't really our thing, it's their thing, and it was just strictly on who was out in the, in the crowd. Um, authenticity is, it's, an, it's an, in kind of a, an essential idea of a black identity, one of the major things that I was thinking about and talking about when I was writing, talking with the members when I was writing, uh, re researching, and then as I was writing the book. Um, they are trying to be authentic. I mean, they're trying to make, part of what they're doing is trying to make an argument that, that this is an authentic black form that we're producing. Uh, and the way they make the argument is by making a historical argument. Black people have we created this music. Um, we're, you know, and we've been taken out of that history, but we're the founding, we're the originators of this form. And so, and the, the reason making, saying that was important was because of the authenticity of politics. Uh, the other, you know, the other side was dealing with the accusation that they were acting white, or they were doing something that was white, or they weren't being black. And then the other thing we did in class uh, yesterday uh, was we talked about double consciousness and talked about Oreos. So I was distributing Oreo cookies to my students. Um, but the, that, that idea that you're not, you're not really black if you're engaged in this thing, that was something that they suffered, um, you know, going through school and then um, with their family members, just this, a sense of a conflict about what you're, what you're doing aesthetically is somehow not true to who you really are. For them, to be true to who they really were was to participate in this music. So they find themselves, they found themselves needing to make an argument that, that's still in the terms of authenticity. It wasn't just, we want to do it, so we're doing it. Mm -hmm. It still was being using the language of authenticity. And I think for a lot of um, a lot of the RC members, they would like to have a black audience for them. I mean, musicians want to have an audience for the music. We don't care who it is, we just want you in the audience. But then there was there is a part there. Uh, there's a feeling of, no, we want to have a black audience. We want people to see what we're doing as this is black, you know, this is black music, we're still black, you know, the whole thing. Um, and it, and it, was a, it was a struggle and they, the response was to get into, was to, to continue to talk in the language of authenticity to try to pick it over. I had a question, does this have to do like rock music, but it's when is your South Asian music, like rips from South Asian recordings in rap. I think part of that is just trying to keep keep it fresh, keeping it fresh. And it, it and you know, then there could be um, Ariane might say this is purely about marketing. There's a recognition of a, a Latino demographic that maybe we can even get more people interested in this form by you know going in this direction. You have plenty of time. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah. When you were when you were hanging out uh, with the artists, did they regard themselves primarily as black or primarily as musical artists or some interesting fusion? And were there any generational differences? Um, I think well, the people I was hanging out with the research and whatever permission 
uh, we're all of the same gen pretty much the same generation. So, um, and I think I think they definitely saw themselves as black. Now, I, the thing I would say, I think identities always shift. So depending on where you are, you might one one identity may be more important or seem more relevant than another. Um, so I think primarily they would, uh, especially being affiliating with an organization that is clearly marked as a black organization with an issue that's of, of importance to black people, there's certainly a primary uh, association with one's black identity, but you know, depending on what's going on in a particular moment, other identities might might come into play. But I think, you know, when we social scientists try to talk about identity construction, it is always that idea of fluidity and shifting and depending on context. about the, the band's uh, clothing, wardrobe, etc. Um, there is like this idea, I think, um, that around black male rockers that androgyny or mm -hmm. gender play is a part of um, their MO. I think that like the, there's this whole dialogue around Prince for comedians and for, I think, black folks in general <laughs> about um, sort of having to come to terms with this, this gender bending or this gender play. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and perhaps what that might mean for um, black rockers trying to get acceptance among a black audience. Um, I, th I mean, Little Richard is a he's a good example um, of that kind of renewable uh, performativity. I would broaden it because it, it, Chuck Berry wasn't about that and um, Bo Diddley wasn't about that. So I think, I do think sexuality is really, the performance of sexuality is really important in rock. And it might be like with well, Little Richard, a queer sexuality. Um, but for someone like um, uh, like a Chuck Berry or very famously a Jimi Hendrix, it's a straight male sexuality. But it's it's sexuality. And I think that's what gets performed. And that's and that's not just black rockers, it's white rock, white male rock. So rock and roll is a real, is a place to put one's sexuality forward uh, and to play with it, and it'll you know you're not supposed to talk about that stuff in public, and that's what they're doing, and that's why rock and roll was so um, so dangerous, especially when it first came out, because it was sexual and it was black people's sexuality. Well, I have a question. I'm still trying to figure out exactly how to phrase it, but I was wondering how many uh, people of that generation from the Black Rock Coalition come from immigrant families from the Caribbean, from, you know, people from, from, from Africa. And I, I put that out there because there's a definitely a different perception about what kinds of music people can listen to when you get out in black communities, in the sport communities when you get out of the United States. When I go home to Barbados, everybody's listening to everything under the sun, and it's all American music. And it doesn't matter whether it's white rockers or, you know, heavy metal, kiss American music, and so that's accepted. So I'm just kind of wondering, because I know at least one of those members of uh, women color comes from a Caribbean American um, right. background, yeah. whether you feel that kind of influence their ability to kind of grasp all these things. That, um, part of, I think part of it, I, I'm not sure if it was because it was New York or if it's because of the openness, if it's a combination, because there were a number of BRC members who are, uh, their parents came from the Caribbean. And that was in place. Um, there were a couple of people who I met out here whose parents were in South Africa. And so there it might be the case that you know, there's definitely more open. There's, in so, at some level, there's more openness um, to listening to different things. Um, and that was one of the things that we did. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's some things. It's not, it's not all native born. I mean, uh, the parents weren't all native born. Uh, OK, well, we want to thank. Uh, Professor Mann for an exciting talk. Let's give it a Maureen is uh, also part of the Bunch Center Steering Committee uh, that's what we'll call it, for the Festival of African American Music, which will be part of UCLA's year.
Theater of the Arts coming up in November and fall 2005. So there will be a number of other scholars, and Maureen herself, who will be talking about this issue, this issue and some of the other topics related to African American music. And uh, you can always check our website at uh, www.bunchcenter.ucla.edu for more information in the future. At this time, because I know many of you uh, have already taken care of your holiday bills and, and you're ready to read this research, football season is just about over. We encourage you to come on over and uh, get a book to read. And uh, uh, we have a representative here from UCLA's uh, bookstore who will help you uh, take care of that. And we thank you again for coming out to the uh, Bunch Center uh, for this event. Thank you.